Good evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Fran Hildebrandt, Central Great Lakes Region President. For those of you who do know me, I'm still Fran Hildebrandt. Welcome to Book Buzz, our Region Book Talk. I'm looking forward to hearing all the buzz about our book, The Color of Love. It's so good to see so many familiar faces and I'm looking forward to getting to know those of you who I don't know. It's wonderful that we can all be together biyachad, for this last night of Hanukkah. Let us use the light that is reflected from the candles to transform our world from darkness into light. Let us be the light to celebrate the miracles of life. Let us share the light to spread hope together. Biyachad. It is a pleasure to welcome Debbie Kaner Goldich, International President of Women's League for Conservative Judaism, who will share a few words with us before we light candles. And when I call your names, ladies, the reason we are doing this with little screens is so you can wave and people can see who you are. A special welcome. So Debbie, you need to wave. We're waiting. Thank you. See, she did it so eloquently. She waved and smiled. A special welcome to Ellen Bresnick and Julia Loeb, who co-chair WLCJ's education program. You ladies have to wave also, even if I don't say it, okay? I'm happy to see Meryl Karras, who co-chairs Women's League Reads, with our own Susan Farber. Also, Eileen Rubin, WLCJ World Community Engagement Chair, is with us. I'd also like to welcome Region Presidents, Esther Lichtenstein from North Atlantic Region, and Kathy Swerdlow from Florida Region. They're also with us tonight. And then a final hello to our region board members who are with us tonight. Marjorie Maxwell, who manages our money. Rebecca Goldwasser, who keeps us in the know by sending out our region newsletter. Robin Lash, who is our education program team lead and part of this program. And Susan Farber, our region books chair and facilitator for tonight's program. Susan, you have to wave. Good. <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Robin and Susan for all their hard work in creating what I think is going to be an amazing program that we are already enjoying and will be participating in this evening. Thank you for spreading the light. A couple uh, housekeeping items. If you have not already muted yourself, please do. Um, Except for when, you're, when you are speaking, we're hoping you'll stay muted. Um, what, we're what we plan to do is have, uh, Susan of course will not be muted and she will be the facilitator of our discussion. Robin is going to act as, as uh, the person who will be ca calling on you. So probably it's a good idea to try to wave, you know, wave your hand either electronically or, in, or um, on screen. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat and between the three of us, we hope we'll keep this going. And it, certainly if you see someone who, who wants to say something and we don't know this, please let us know. Um, and of course, um, uh, for those of you who are just coming on again, um, we're recording this and actually we hope you'll listen to it both either on the WLCJ website or on our website. Um, at this point in time, I would like to ask Debbie Goldich to say a few words, and she is going to light the candles with us and for us if you have your menorah with you. Debbie? Thank you, Fran. So good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful to be with Central Great Lakes Region. Um, three years ago, I was fortunate enough to be your consultant and I met so many wonderful women and became friends with them. And I love coming back to your region so I can see all of you again. I see many of you on the daily Psalms. I see many of you on our programming and it's just wonderful to be with you tonight. 
Um, so we're here tonight in this holy community to light the menorah as a group so that no one should light it alone. We're also here to celebrate being together, the Since 1918, Women's League has been the voice of thousands of Jewish women in North America. We're still here and we are still your voice. Our programs and experiences may be different since 1918, but our mission to offer educational opportunities is the same. Our small flame continues to light up the Jewish world. And so may you always feel this sense of community and as connected to your Women's League sisters as you do tonight. Chag Sameach to all, and may you stay healthy and safe. And now I'm taking all of you into my kitchen where my menorah is so we can light candles together. Would like to get your candles ready and your matches. And I was invited to sing the blessings, but I'm very happy to have all of you unmute and sing with me, especially if you're lighting. Asher Kishanu Vimitzvotav, Etsivanu, Aharlik Ner, Shel Hanuka, Adonai, Elohinu Melacholam, Sandi Sin Lavotainu, Iomi. Hello, everybody. I am Robin Lash, your education and program team lead. And I'd like to also welcome you to Book Buzz. And there is a lot to buzz about this book, The Color of Love. But I want to introduce you to Susan Farver, this evening's facilitator. She grew up in New York City, where she studied at the Prosdor, a JTSA high school program, and went on to college in New York, where she acquired a double major in both education and French. After studying in France for one academic year, she moved to Cincinnati to be a French immersion teacher for four years. Her travels took her to Germany and then to England to work as a teacher for the Department of Defense schools. That sounds really interesting, Susan. In 1993, she returned to her beloved Cincinnati and now teaches part-time in a very small private school for gifted children. She is a proud member of Women's League and supportive of Central Great Lake Region efforts to bring women together. In her spare time, she loves craft projects, container gardening, doing volunteer work for nonprofits, and above all, she's an avid reader. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to our facilitator, Susan Farber. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Fran, for making all of this possible and joining us. And I really thank all of you for choosing to make the time to be with us tonight to discuss this intriguing memoir that's very timely, considering how much we are having to think about our personal identity and how we react and how we connect to other people or with other people. So one of the things I want to do before I deal with or share some guiding questions, um, and I really am pleased to see so many people I haven't seen for a while. Um, if you have a specific event of the book that you really feel was riveting or um, emotionally uh, engaging, if you want to, could you please raise your hand or write in the chat box 
what that was and I'll wait for about a minute or so for you to answer um, one way or the other. Robin, do you notice, Mindy, I see your hand is up, so why don't you start? Hi, I'm Mindy. I'm one of the members in Cincinnati, uh, and I see a lot of faces from uh, events I've been to, so it's nice to see all you ladies. Um, one, of the event, one of the events in the book that um, struck me was the uh, incident where she um, explained to um, her brother um, what the N-word meant. And um, I grew up in a white neighborhood, which still had a lot of Jewish members. And the elementary school that I went to for two or three years, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, happened to have um, three black families. Now that three black families meant two sisters and two of their cousins, and that was it. Um, and the two sisters happened to be my age and my sister's age. And they happened to be in Girl Scouts with us. And so Audrey and I were really good friends. And somewhere in sixth grade, we talked about getting together to do something together. And she hesitated for a minute because I was supposed to go over to her house. And I hadn't been over her house in years. I did when I was younger, but not much. Anyway, um, and so she basically said to me, I don't think that my friends would like to have you around or whatever the wording was. And I countered with a very defensive, well, I don't think my white friends would like having you around. And so it pretty much ended our friendship there. Well, it turns out we went to high school together again and we reconnected and we went, got past it and we still never socialized a lot together. Um, I did find that even now I had a lot of black friends in high school, I never could, um, we really didn't socialize. The blacks socialized differently than the whites and the Jewish whites so, uh, socialized different. I don't see that with my children, thank goodness. Um, they, it's a, it's a plus and a minus on whether their friends are Jewish or not, but um, they live in a uh, international world. And so they, and they grew up that way. And so there wasn't as big of an issue, but um, I didn't meet anybody that was black and Jewish till I was 50 plus years old. I never even, it never even crossed my mind that there would be anybody Jewish that had darker skin than me. I'm rather dark complected. Um, I grew up with the uh, joke in my family that, um, and I can say it with the group of women here, but I wouldn't say it out in public, um, is I grew up more dark complected than my other three siblings, even though my father and my grandfather were a little bit more dark complected. And they used to tease me that, I, you know how you say you're the milk man's kid? Well, they used to tease me that I was the mailman's kid because we had a black mailman growing up my whole time. So, um, so you know, I, I was always darker than my sister and darker than my brother. So, you know, just the way it is. So that's Thank all it is. Thank you, Mindy. Anyone else have a specific a aspect of the book they Joan really would like us to? Joan Broad has her hand up. Hi. The uh, thing that struck me the most in the book, it was very emotional, that this uh, young lady was in a synagogue. She was raised Jewish. She had a bat mitzvah. She went every Saturday with her family to shul. And the guard followed her as she was going to the ladies' room to say, what are you doing here? And she had to explain that she belonged there just like any of us. So that really struck me how that must have young girl must have felt. Thank you, Joan. Anybody else have an event that they really would like us to discuss? Kayla. Um, there you go. Did you call me, Sheila? I well, a, yeah, you, you had your hand up, so I called you. Yes. Um, I think that struck me was how, um, when the parents went to the hospital to get her, how they must have felt when they saw her color and how um, their love for having her as a child just overtook any 
prejudice. But that initial, when they went to the hospital, I wondered how um, any of my contemporaries or my children's contemporaries would feel. They knew that they were getting a child, but they didn't know it was biracial. The other thing was at the end of the book where um, Nettie, was that, was that her name, Nettie? Um, mm -hmm was suddenly nice to her for a short period of time <laughs> and uh, how cruel she was all the way through and um, where she would do things for her sister and not for her, give her gifts or take her places. Yeah, that, that stuck in my mind. Linda. Thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I, I just could not believe Nettie when she had the gall to tell her there's nothing worse than black. To take a child that belongs to your sister-in-law, was that the was that the relation? Whatever the relationship was, she was such an evil woman, and it just killed me when not only did she say that, but as Sheila explained, every action she gave jewelry to the other, to her sister. She invited her out to California. She was such a mean person. And that to me was absolutely horrifying. And how, how the author, Hamara Bigod, had such a loving attitude, the way she embraced her belief that it's better to shalom babayit, as we say, rather than just, um, and she was the one to help Nettie out when there was nobody else. She was really, she is really an amazing woman. Sylvia. Um, the part of the book that I found the most disturbing was the description of um, uh, Mara dating and thinking that these uh, young men really liked her. Um, and when the young men uh, who she really thought something was going to develop with, and he said, I can't ever take a girl like you home to meet my parents. And um, that really bothered me that it appeared when she was uh, a young woman in high school and college that um, she was very nicely integrated into um, her Jewish youth group and into her uh, group of friends, but that it, it's that only that one young man was honest enough to say that, but it was re I thought that was very disturbing because the period of this book is the 1970s and the 1980s when she's a teen and a young adult. And I could have seen that as an attitude in the 1930s, but to find that as an attitude in the 1980s, I found very disturbing. Do you wanna move on, Robin? Absolutely. Okay, so one of, in somewhere in chapter nine, Mara God writes, if the door does not open for you, it's not your door. So my question to you is, and, and this relates to your life experience and, and kind of, if I can follow up, if the door does not open for you, it's not your door. So Sylvia, you mentioned about those relationships with men, those dating experiences, obviously, at some point, these men close the door. You know, they don't, it doesn't open into a, a full-fledged relationship that has longevity. So that's one example of a door not opening for her. And as Linda, I think, talked about the synagogue guard, you know, saying, who, who are you to be in our synagogue? It's kind of the synagogue door closing on her. Um, and, and we're horrified in, the majority of us are probably horrified by that because we wouldn't think that that would be an acceptable way today, especially, or even for many of us in the last three, three, four decades of our lives, we wouldn't feel good witnessing someone being rejected entree into a synagogue that just doesn't sit with us if we really hold true to our Jewish values of hachnasat orchim, welcoming the stranger or a guest. And so um, 
So to me, those were two examples. So my question to you is, have you ever seen something happen in your own life that you notice the door's not opening for you, that it's not my door then? Does anybody have any willingness to personalize this to them, their own life, as this is Mara God's memoir, she's sharing her experiences. Do we, does anybody feel comfortable talking about something that happened to them that was sort of a door closing for them? Robin? Oh, thank you for calling on me. You know, when I graduated college in 1976, uh, I, I graduated, I was a vocal music education major and I, I'm a theater arts specialist. But back at that time, they were downsizing because the population was decreasing of children. So every time I would go for an interview, that door was never opened. And it was making me question whether my choice of education was a good choice. Now, I was teaching in a, in a public school system. I was a permanent sub and I was going for what I thought was the final interview to sign on the dotted line finally for a contract. And when I got there, I saw a, young, a woman there and, and we started to talk. She says, what are you here for? And I said, well, I'm here for the vocal music job. I'm signing the contract. She says, well, that's what I'm here for. And that door slammed on me again. But what was crazy is she said, I'm leaving my job at a school called Hillel Day School. And she and I switched jobs. But to have so many times that door slamming and slamming and, and you keep wondering, is it me? Like, what did I do wrong? Why am I not fitting into this building? Or oh, you're, you're a wonderful teacher this year, but you know, you're at the bottom of the totem pole, so we have to get rid of you. It was really, uh, it was really difficult. It was a very difficult time from 70 to about 87. Linda. Linda. Unmute. So, yeah, that's what I was in the process of doing. So I lived in Israel for a year and uh, wanted to go back and I wanted to be a veterinarian and I grew up in New York City and Cornell would have been my school and at the time there were 19 veterinary schools in the United States and so I was one of eight women that Cornell deigned to interview there were five men interviewing me the first question was what was the nature of your trip to Israel and are you going back and the second was, do you ever want to get married and have children? The one woman they accepted that year was a six foot tall woman from Kentucky who wanted to go into large animal medicine. Fortunately, and I had medical school was my backup. If I didn't get into vet school, I would go to med school. Fortunately, the University of Pennsylvania was building an extension that would enable 15 more students to come in and it was completed. And I, along with four other girls from New York City were accepted at Penn. The tuition was, I think two or $3,000 at Penn and 600 at Cornell. Fortunately, since my dad didn't have to spend money to send me to college because I went to Brooklyn College, it was not a problem. But it was, it was really a horrific experience because I was a Jew that I was not welcome at the Cornell School of Veterinary Medicine, as well as being a woman. It's kind of reflected of RBG, since we mentioned her earlier. <laughs> I hate to say, yeah. It reminds me of my high school physics teacher who happened to be Jewish. And he happened, Mr. Rosenberg. And he said to me, Sabra, don't worry, you don't have to worry about learning physics. You know, it was very patronizing about hard science. You know, what can I say? So, anyone else? Nope, I think we're gonna move on. Okay. 
So this is kind of related to some of the quest comments I heard earlier about the the, the evilness of Nettie that I can't remember. Was it Joan that you mentioned it? Is is the evilness of Nettie? Was it Joan or somebody else used the word evil? No, it's no. somebody else. What is it? It was someone Some, else. Someone else. Okay. So anyway, this is something she quoted a writer named Cleo Wade, and I did not try to figure out who Cleo Wade is, but she quotes someone, something to remember when hope gets hard, anything is possible and love is the only way forward. And I think her life is exemplary of how she kind of, wherever she went, she tried to find a person who would be loving to her. And sometimes it happened and sometimes not. I mean, I shouldn't have said what I said, but you know, I, I was struck by this about how hope gets hard. Has anyone felt that way about their life? That their life has really, there's been an event in their life that has really forced them to look deep and hard to be hopeful about their future. We could see that in today's life. You know, a lot of people have been confronted by very challenging things economically or medically. Um, so I thought that was a powerful quote. I don't know if anyone feels like talking about it, um, but we could, I could move on to other quotes that I've found. But I thought that was an interesting one. Everyone, everyone's quiet. Yeah. Well, you, it's a heavy you, quote. It's a heavy quote, and it's and it's in this time and age, what we're dealing with is forcing us to really look deep and hard for love and hope. So, um, reminds me of a sign. I see someone is handwritten at the side of the road. Make America love again. Kind of an interesting commentary on what we're seeing. Okay, to get back with the memoir's title, The Color of Love, and again, love, and how the love the parents wanted to give a child um, was stronger than any prejudice that a parent at that time could have had for a biracial child. So here we go back in chapter 11, she says, she writes, each of us is born to love and to be loved. I believe that love is why we are here. So love is very central to the story. I, I think that I want to though, talk about her parents from a different okay. perspective. You okay. see, um, I don't know how many of you were able to have a child, but I knew from the age of 16, I would never be able to birth a child ever. So when the parents look down at that bundle, it fulfills a dream for them and they don't care. Uh, they just saw the love that they had for this child. You know, and I can remember when they placed my son in my arms, I, I didn't care that he was like as long as a giraffe, you know, oh, and you think I'm kidding? He's six, seven, okay? Um, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what he looked like. It, it, nothing mattered. What mattered was I had a child and now I had a family. And I think that's what her parents were all about. They didn't see really the color of the child. They saw the child. And, and, I, and I really related to that very much, very deeply. Marlene, did you, Marlene Ostrich, do you want to say something? I'm glad Robin uh, brought that up and thanks for sharing such a, a personal and important part of your life story. Um, her parents wanted to be, to be, parents they wanted to experience it they wanted to raise a child or children 
And her biological mother, if I recall, I read the book a couple of weeks ago, didn't she specify that the, the baby daughter only be placed with the Jewish family? Did she specify that in the book? No, she did? I thought she did. I thought, I thought, she, I thought she did. But clearly this is about values, you know, kind of in ethics. The, the woman, her biological mother knew that she wasn't going to be able to keep and raise this child as her own and parent her. But she wanted her to have parents and love and, and, and more specifically a Jewish parents and Jewish love and Jewish be part of the Jewish tradition. So I think she, I mean, they say, you know, the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. Children learn what they see and hear, you know, all of those cliches, all of that was going on. I mean, she had amazing parents. And they knew that she was unique for all the obvious and maybe not so obvious reasons. And they wanted to love her and have her have the best and the strongest. And, and they were there for her. So the contrast between Aunt Nettie, you know, who actually never had children, had multiple husbands, and in my humble opinion, was rather narcissistic and shallow, um, and she showed her colors from the very beginning, her, 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 her aunt, that, you know, making the, the comments about that her, she, her time would come to visit or get a present or go on a travel, it never happened. And then of all places and times at her sister's wedding to say that horrible thing, you know, to her niece, it was just... <laughs> the most horrible thing I can imagine, a relative saying to another young person. Um, and the fact that she she holds love at the center of her moral compass and everything she does, to me is so amazing and so powerful and such a reflection of, of, of loving parents and somebody who's, who's centered and against all the obstacles. I mean, and, and to me, her whole story also reflected how white Judaism in America is or was. I was wondering if perhaps she had, you know, grown up in Israel or in another country where there might have been more diversity um, in the Jewish population. But still, I'm perceived as white, I'm Jewish, but I don't have to deal with the, the otherness of Black or African American or, or biracial. And to think that she never fit in fully in either the Jewish, and I would have to say white Jewish, Midwestern world, or the African American Gentile or non-Jewish world. I guess there's, there's obviously there's other biracial Jews in the country, especially now. But you know, she's she's an amazing person. I would love to you know meet with her, one on one. Fran, so. Marlene, everything you said, there was so much, so many different directions I could go in with what you said, but I'd like to just bring up two ideas. One is we lived in um, Southeast Asia in the early 80s. And um, we, lived, we lived on the island of Sumatra and we were the Jewish family there. And we were very close friends with the only African-American family also there. And we both felt at various times outsiders and had friends, they had friends who were Jewish back in the States. We had friends here who were African American, but it didn't. And so for us, it was a really lovely experience getting to know this family. And I have pictures to this day of us sharing Hanukkah together um, with them and all kinds of things. But we experienced there um, the kinds of things that she writes about, mainly because it was that period of time and people could not see past differences. They really, uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel any anti-Semitism uh, from Indonesians, but I did from expats. So having said that, I think that the other part that goes with that is your discussion of the color of love. And if you think about it, the author's um, parents, both sides of that family, if I'm remembering correctly, experienced a lot of dysfunctionality and abuse. So there was a problem with love all the way through that family. And it is really a, 
an amazing thing that her parents were so loving and caring and her grandmother was because they didn't seem to come from a background that taught it and practiced it and modeled it. So it made me, as I was listening to you, think about how really it wasn't just about her story and the color of love. It was the difficulty on multiple levels, like an onion of, of peeling it. Okay. And I, I mean, it was really very meaty what you had to say. Anyone else want to speak? I'm perusing. Oh, Sheila. And Sandy does. Oh, Sandy, I missed you. And Mindy. I think um, I was also taken back by the fact that the birth mother did not tell anyone that the child was biracial. And what if the parents didn't have this love of the child right away? They could have said, we don't want a biracial child. They didn't have any idea that the child was biracial as far as I can remember the story. And also the other thing, the love of the grandmother. She was so close with her grandmother and um, it kind of, I, I love that feeling of always being, you know, held by her grandmother and talked to her and her grandmother made her feel so special and everything. As we all as grandparents try to make our grandchildren feel so special. But um, I thought about that as um, someone was, someone chatted, someone wrote in that she hadn't told the rabbi, I guess who was arranging the adoption, that the child was biracial. What if they hadn't taken her? That was, that was an option. Because he asked her, if you remember, he asked her specifically, are you sure you want to adopt this child? But they weren't told beforehand, right? No, they weren't. No. And I don't, I don't think the medical staff nor the rabbi had any anticipation what the child would appear like once born. Mm -hmm. Because as I, I don't think as somebody, Sheila, you may have mentioned a few minutes ago that the rabbi had any clue who the father of the child was. He just knew that this was a young Jewish woman. She knew she couldn't take care of the baby and uh, went up to Binghamton, we just mentioned Binghamton with its snowy weather, and birthed the baby there, and then returned to New York City to her prior world. I, I think I remember reading somewhere that uh, she writes, Mara, God writes at some point that she, the word mistake was used to describe her by somebody. And... Uh, that's really a horrible, you know, heavy thing. And for some reason, she overcomes that label. But um, Robin, you said Sandy, was Sandy Carlton the one who wanted to speak? Yes. Okay, Sandy, go yes. ahead. Um, can you hear me, Susan? Yes, we can. Go okay. ahead, Sandy. Okay, so um, I attend um, a monthly um, session on racism that's held at um, the temple where we're housed. It's, um, and, you know, the, you know, after, um, after, you know, all the things that had happened this summer and, and whatever, the, you know, the rabbi felt that she needed to start a discussion, um, you know, dealing with weight racism. And the woman who leads it is um, a um, African American woman who um, is is married to um, a congregation member um, who just recently finished his um, time as president of the congregation. She's also um, an anthropology professor at a nearby college, and she's leading this discuss discussion. And she usually puts out. Um, articles for us to read before the session. And um, the week, the month before last, the article was entitled, How Did Jews Become White Folks? And the little abstract, the, just very two line abstract here. 
One way to see how societies constructed race and ethnicity is to look at the historical experiences of particular categories of people in the United States. A century ago, the author of this selection explains Jews and other European immigrants were defined as non-white. After World War II, however, Jews were included among white folks. So, you know, to most of us there, um, reading this article was, you know, um, a, a surprise. I mean, I've always had, my skin is darker. My sister was as light as I was dark. And especially in the summer, um, you know, with the tan, um, you know, I always looked dark, but I, I was never taken for African American. I've taken, I've been taken for almost everything else. Um, you know, people have come up to me and asked me, you know, in, when I was in college at the union at U of I, where I was from, and I, you know, I'd say, you know, near Chicago, and they'd say, you know, no, where before that, you know, and, and, and different things, I, you know, but um, it was interesting, you know, it was interesting that, you know, before my lifetime that a lot of, a lot of Jewish people, at least in some circles were considered non-white. Mindy. <clears throat> Hi, uh, I had two thoughts. Um, one of them was similar to what Sheila talked about, um, that she was very close to her Bubby. And I don't know if she talks a lot about her Zadie, but I remember about her Bubby. And um, so even though the beginning of the book talks about so many relatives that they no longer spoke to because of her being biracial, um, she had a strong mother and at one point her father went, before he passed away and a Bubby that totally supported her. And um, it takes me back to um, my Bubby who had, I guess it was 12, 14 grandchildren. And we didn't live in town, but some of the other grandchildren did. And when we went to see her, we felt like just like all the rest of the grandkids. We didn't feel like we got special treatment because we came in from out of town and we didn't feel like we were ignored because we weren't there all the time. But one of my cousins uh, was born with cerebral palsy. And um, uh, I remember incidents with him with Sunday school because I, if I was in town on a Sunday, I would go to Sunday school with him um, and things like that. Um, and how he was looked upon that he wasn't going to be able to be a bar mitzvah and stuff, which he was able to do but they just automatically saw the braces on his legs and assumed that his mind wasn't very good. And um, one of my best friends happened to not be Jewish, but he happens to have studied a lot about Judaism and knows Hebrew better than I do. And um, he also has cerebral palsy, but a brilliant mind. So, you know, one thing doesn't mean the same, but what I'm getting at is she talked about the otherness and you can't change the color of your skin. It's something people notice just like an outward disability, but there's tons of people that go through life with internal disabilities that, you know, they can't don't show to the world, but they're still there. And I think Judaism has a long way to go about including everybody into the congregation. Um, the other thing is a few years back, I went to a book talk because the author happened to be a Cincinnati native, or actually he's been here a long time. His name is John Entine, and the name of the book is called Abraham's Children, Race, Identity, and the DA DNA of the Chosen People. And I don't know if people have read it. I know that, that some of the people in Cincinnati definitely have. Um, I'm trying to remember what year it came out, but uh, it talks about um, the basics of it is the guy worked for uh, Ted Koppel years ago and they were doing some kind of um, uh, story, a series of stories about um, why certain Olympic runners from certain countries are better than other sprinters and, and, and um, long distance runners. And what they found is that they, the long distance came from one part of Africa and the sprinters came from a different part of Air Africa and that was in their DNA. So along with him doing this story, he started getting curious about Jewish DNA because he's Jewish, ended up having uh, family members, all female, that had died of breast cancer, found out that he was carrying the BRCA gene. 
So he really got into the genetics of all of it because of that, had two daughters that carried the BRCA gene. And so he wanted to know more about DNA. And along the way, he discovered that there was a Jewish tribe from Africa um, and that they were all black. So whether they're actually the Ethiopian Jews that have gone to Israel or not, sort of doesn't really say back then. But uh, it just was an interesting story. And I was sort of glad I had read that before I read The Color of Love. So. Uh, would you be so kind to put the uh, title sure. of that book and the author in the chat so other people can pick it up? That would be awesome. Not a problem. All right, Susan, I'm going to turn it back to you for our next talking point. Oh, okay. sorry. You, uh, I didn't see. Uh, Sylvia wanted to speak. I thought her hand was up. I've already talked to her. She's uh, she's leaving uh, right now. Okay. 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 All right. So three phrases that she talks about later in her book. I think this came about um, while she's in California and she's living there because she's trying to take, you know, she knows from her mother that somebody has to take care of Nettie and she realizes how Nettie and Nettie's husband, the uh, Japanese man, I think he, wasn't he Japanese? I think the Japanese man, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, but how they were living in this, you know, house that Polly was once very lovely, but had fallen into disrepair and, and on, on, unkempt. And, um, and then she, so, so she, she kind of comes to some conclusion during these weeks or months that she's going to California to take care of the situation. And she has these three, three phrases that she mentions at this time period. She says, sense of peace, smaller body, bigger heart. And I bring them together because I think that Mara God sees a connection between serenity, comfort with her body and self-image and the power of love to love. And my question is, why do you think she sees this connection when she attains some sense of serenity and she is comfortable more with her body and self-image? I think that's referring to the fact that at some point she's, in, she's starting to shed some weight that she, she realizes she had become a little too chunky, if I could use that word. And, and she realizes how her heart is becoming bigger because of all the things she's doing now and, and what she's confronted with. And I was just wondering what, what you see, why is there a connection between these three aspects of her life? Anyone have an idea? Oh, I'm searching for people to put their hands up. Some of you are the quietest I've ever seen you. Oh, Maureen, so nice to hear from you. You have to unmute Maureen. Okay, okay. I did, can Good. you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Now we can, okay. thank you. Um, I think this is her journey of development because she has, she has been through so much and she's such an, I think she realizes or has come to realize how exceptional her journey has become in some psychic way. And realizing that she's had all this love to give, but she had to start to find a sense of peace in herself and acceptance of herself to fully give her love in a way that it will be accepted. And she just soldiered through. She was absolutely tenacious about finding and breaking through the barriers that she was confronted with at every single stage that she went through. It was a phenomenal story and, and very heartwarming. And it's hard to talk about it without choking up. Beautifully said, Maureen, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts on this? I, Marlene? 
Oh, Marlene, go ahead. Just, just a kind of continuation. I mean, she faces all these abs obstacles and questions where she fits in and it makes you question yourself. And so it's an old adage, but it's true. You really need to, one needs to love themselves. You have to have self-love before you can really do anything else or move on with your life or love another person. And whether that's a romantic partner or whether it's her netty or whether it's to, you know, accept her, her, her sister and brother-in-law. Um, she did get along with her, um, Nettie's husband. Was it Zeet or Zeit? Must right. have been a nickname. Right. Zeit, yeah, that's but, it, Zeit. Yeah. Um, she realizes that there's absolutely nothing wrong with her and that, um, you know, she loves herself and she knows her strengths. And um, so that, that helps her, I think, to, to, to move forward. But um, I would really love to have coffee with her. That's my closing remark. See, I think when I was reading this book, I believe we can all relate to this. We have all had to take journeys in our lives. So the journey of self-awareness and self-love is not just unique to her, but some of the experiences on this journey were unique to her because of being biracial, because, uh, because of Nettie's attitude but I, I think I could so relate to her. Um, uh, I, I know, I never thought I, here's another one. I never thought I was married. See, you, you see me this way, but put another 135 pounds on me. That was me. And it was a very hard journey for me to go from that to this. And so I saw her struggle in the same way I saw some of my own. And like you, um, uh, Marlene, I, I, some of this, I mean, Maureen, this brought tears to my eyes because I could so relate, not only for myself, but to see the struggle of others in her. So I, I think it was a very profound book for me. Fran, I see your hand. Uh, uh, I was gonna say, as I was listening to you, I think that is part of why this book is so appealing. We are outraged on her behalf because how she was treated was terrible. And we want to support her and somehow make her life better. And at the same time, we can relate to her and personalize. It, it may not have been, we may not have had her precise experiences, but that journey you're talking about is something that we all go on based on the individual that we are. And so we can personalize her experiences and yet at the same time want to support her and be outraged on her behalf. So I think this book is, is so meaningful, it's like an onion that you unpeel and there's more and more layers and levels to it, the more we get into it with all the different quotes, Susan, you have. Thank you. Okay. I think we're gonna go on. I think we have, how much more time are we supposed to be talking? So I know we it's have, nine o'clock. It it's is nine right now, nine o'clock. We've been talking for um, an, almost an hour. My suggestion is that we, we wrap it up within the next 15 minutes. If okay. you have a couple other questions or people I'll, want I'll to- I'll leave it comments. to two. I'll leave it to one and then we'll wait for comments. So dear Robin and her persistent nature reached out to Mara God's publicist and when Mara God's publicist shared with her that we were going to have this book talk tonight Mara God wrote some comments and one of the things she talks is she encourages us to be a holy community so my question is what do you, why does she encourage us to be a holy community and what do you think her vision of a holy community what does that look like and in many respects, we are. So, so let's see if anybody 
hopefully somebody is eager to share with us who hasn't spoken until now. So I leave it up to somebody. What does it mean to be a holy community? What does it mean? Marjorie, did your hand go up and down or was I confused? I was confused. Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca, unmute yourself. No, you're muted. We can't hear you. Ah, oh, now you can hear me. Sorry. Technology has not been my friend today. Um, a holy community to me is a community that is welcoming to everybody, um, regardless of um, backgrounds, um, that it all, you know, we're welcoming to everyone. And um, I think that. It's, first of all, her Jewish identity was always important to her. And so I think that that's why she, it was important for us to be a holy community. And I think for her also it is, is that we practice being welcoming and accepting of everyone, regardless of um, where you're from, what color skin you are, what gender you associate yourself with, what sexual identity, we are a holy community because we accept everyone. Anyone else? Okay, let me change this because I don't see everybody. I see a heart up on Marlene. How does that get there? I, I would I would like I would like to believe that a holy community, in her in her case, in our case, is a Jewish community. And it's, you know, based on <laughs> love thy neighbor as thyself. I mean we all focused it on the similarities rather than dis differences, whatever they may be, the world would be a much better place. But um, she's walking the talk. I mean, she's living it. I mean, her actions are filled with love and giving people the benefit of the doubt. And because she has suffered and been the recipient of recipient on the receiving side of the opposite of love. Of, 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 of hate and of anger or of ostr being ostracized or left out or being made fun of or ignored, she knows that stinks, you know, so she takes the higher road. And um, I guess her call, her clarion call to us is when we have the choice, you know, to act out of love and in love and take the higher road, which I think is great advice. Anybody else? Oh, Sandy. Sandy and then Mindy. You seem to follow each other all the time. I, I just have, I mean, I have two comments. One dealing with the holy community, which I want to hold off for a minute. And the other one is I had a little bit different reaction to the book. Um, when our federation read it um, in September, I couldn't read it because I have trouble dealing with some medical issues. Um, and so I put it away and then as we came closer to this book talk, I, you know, I decided to, to get it, um, and read it, but the, the situation with her aunt, maybe, um, because I have an aunt that, um, I have never, I've had difficulty getting along with, um, is that I, I didn't see her reaching out so much as her aunt, I mean, I, I know that the situation was difficult, but she loved her mother so much. And this mother really cared about this woman, about Nettie. And to me, it was almost um, an act of love on her mother's part. She was so close to her mother. She was so close to her um, grandmother and these, you know, women were just loving people in her life. And I just felt that um, her reaching out um, was kind of what she would do, uh, what, she, you know, what she felt, you know, was her gift to her mother to be able to, to help this woman despite her personal um, feelings. I mean, I've done things. My mother died when I was 18. Wow. And um, I, I vowed that 
um, she took care of her parents so much, my grandparents, um, that I was close to. But I vowed that um, you know, I would do everything in my power um, to make sure I was there for my dad, who I was close to, so it, it wasn't a difficult thing. But, um, you know, that just, that was my, that was one of my mother's um, things that she imparted to me that it's important to, you know, be there for your family. And so to me, I felt like, um, you know, she needed to overlook that because she knew that this, you know, this was important in a way to her mother. So that, you know, I know that the comments I've read and, and heard other people say have not taken that particular um, understanding of it, but that's, that's how I actually looked at the book. In terms of holy community, as I look on my screen, I see Debbie Goldish and every, um, every day when we meet um, at Psalms at noon um, or 11 o'clock my time, um, that's what she calls us is a holy community as, you know, as we meet together. Um, and it really has been, I mean, I knew nobody when I came on March 15th. And I've tried to be on almost every day unless we have a sisterhood board meeting, you know, that overlaps. But, um, you know, we are, we come from different parts of the country. Um, we, have, we have one woman who um, is um, African-American who has felt comfortable enough to join us um, and that we've embraced and, um, you know, and that adds so much to our group, but, you know, I mean, we're all different in so many ways and we have different backgrounds. Um, you know, a lot of people from the East Coast, the West Coast, people from Israel, um, you know, so, um, and we have, I mean, I think, you know, people have accepted each other. Um, so, I mean, when I think of holy communities, I look at Debbie Square, I think, you know, that's kind of what I think of. And if, you know, by the definitions or by the things that people have said, um, I think we do act as a holy community during that time. Well, uh, Mindy, it's your turn. Hi, um, I think of holy community similar to what Rebecca had originally said. Uh, we belong to the same congregation, but um, an inclusive um, community that, that, that welcomes everybody. Um, what I find sometimes is the welcome starts out well, but it doesn't continue. And um, so I think that when, when I read that quote that Mara God had put out there, I was thinking of it in a synagogue community, the greater Jewish community, but also what's been going on with race America and that we need to treat everybody like equals. And she comes from both of those communities, even though she wasn't raised in a black household. She still is seen by the outward community as mixed race or black. And therefore she's an other in the community. Um, and so we need to not have others. We need to all be inclusive. So that's why I thought of that. And then I, there was something I thought of earlier that I also wanted to bring up. Um, I talked about that her Bubby and her mother were such strong influences of love in her life. But if you read the part about the um, apartment building she grew up in, her grandparents lived downstairs and her and her family took over the first floor, but they had a single black mother and a Chinese, I believe, couple that lived above them. So they already had a mixed race community going on in their own building. And I don't know if all of Chicago was like that back then. I sort of doubt that it was, but that probably didn't hurt either. Right. Ellen, I think I saw your hand up. Am I correct? Gotta unmute, unmute Ellen. I'm unmuting, I'm unmuting. Um, I was struck by this book in a number of ways. I, I really appreciated Robin, what you had to say about putting that baby in your arms and having the ability, you want to be a mother so much that a baby is a baby is a baby. If the baby is yellow, pink, red, whatever, that baby is yours from that moment. So I think some of the comments that people have been making, I think maybe just, a, a, an, 
a different experience in coming to motherhood. So may not understand, it really doesn't matter if you have been desperate to be that mother. You know, and I laughed when you said you didn't care if he was a giraffe because that showed how much, you know, you wanted to be a mother. Um, my granddaughter is, was adopted from Kazakhstan and I know how much my daughter wanted to be a mother. So for my mother, and Debbie will vouch for this, for my mother who had this great granddaughter who was, give, we were at her, her Simchat Bat and the baby actually jumped from my daughter's arms into my mother's arms. And that love affair began at that moment. And for my mother, it was who had some very different experiences growing up. That moment was a, a very profound moment. And Debbie and I stood there and watched. My mother fell in love with that baby immediately. And like that Bobby would have killed for that baby. Um, so I laughed when I, you know, when she took the child down, the Bubby took the child down to have her hair straightened. And, you know, in that moment, taking her into that salon, um, I saw my mother in front of me. And, um, you know, so that was really, really important. The other thing that I wanted to say when um, you were talking about the Kahila Kadosha, the Holy Community, um, you, you know, and you were talking about um, Debbie talking every day about it being Kehila Kadosha. The one thing that's lovely about that Psalms community is, and I think it's something that we should all strive for as we have our own little Kehila Kadosha. And this is certainly, you know, every, every reading group, every women's league program, we have them in various ways. I think there's a tremendous respect in that daily community and it is welcoming and people bring different strengths to that community and people teach in that community and people admit readily if they know something, if they don't know something. And I have never seen such a, a, a really strong supportive group that, okay, if you don't know something, I'll help you, but I won't embarrass you. I won't correct you in public. I won't, um, you know, do anything that would make you feel as if it's you're not part of this community. And so one of the things that happens is every day, everybody says, oh, so-and-so, you did a great job on this. And it's not a meaningless comment, but rather it's a really, I'm, I'm happy that you, you know, you felt the strength to, to teach us or to learn with us or to whatever. So the inclusivity is on a very different level. It's on a, a really emotional and supportive level. So I think that also is part of being, um, you know, nobody would ever dream of correcting anybody in public. And I think that's a really important kind of thing. They turn it around into a very positive kind of thing. So I think for Mara God to say to us to be that Kehila Kadosha, I, I think there's something very profound there as far as how we treat each other. So that's another thing. And she certainly was not treated well. So I'm done. <laughs> Marlene? Just one quick question talking about Mara God. Susan, is there any way that you could find out if she could come, maybe we should ask Debbie or the rabbi if she could come to our um, midday call to talk with us sometime? Robin, what do you say? Robin? Um, Robin was the one who reached out to her publicist. There's probably a fee attached to that. Everybody. Okay. Um, that's why, okay. So uh, I had thought about her coming to this um, and I realized there would be a fee. So I just bugged him for a statement. I said, now she, she's a writer. Tell me she can't write five lines. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, why I said persistence. <laughs> yeah, really. I. I persistent. You know, I noticed that some of you haven't spoken, but I did want to give you an opportunity to speak if you would like to before uh, my formal sign off. Uh, and thanks. I just wanted to ask yes. Lin Linda Schoenberg. Linda, did I pronounce your name correctly? It's Schoenberg. You did. You did. Okay. So Linda, you had typed in the chat box 
about the Chicago community of Ethiopian Jews and that the rabbi of that community is presenting a virtual lecture perhaps? I somehow must have deleted, I get a bazillion emails and I, I, I'm sorry that I did because it's something that sounded to be interesting. Um, and it, I went to the Biachad uh, programming, their site, you know, from the university, American Jewish University, I think they have the Biachad program. It's not them. I don't know who's offering that particular program, but because there's so much going on with inclusion now and the synagogue that I belong to uh, perhaps a month ago had three of our members, two brothers um, and a woman. The woman converted and she was in a bathroom once and a kid saw her and like freaked out and people thought she you know, was one of the uh, kitchen help. I mean, these terrible things have happened to the woman. The two men, um, the, the one man found out when he spoke to an aged relative of his who knew everything about the family, she said, and this guy tried every religion, seriously. He, he was into Buddhism, you name it, he tried it. She says, well, you know, your grandfather was Jewish. So he had Jewish roots in him and um, he is a very learned guy. And it was very interesting to hear their thoughts about it. And one of the things we're hoping is that this um, African-American woman who belongs to our shul will come to our sisterhood book dis uh, discussion next Wednesday night. Uh, hopefully, she, and, and it's not that easy getting a hold of the book. Um, so anyway, um, I just thought, wow, because the Ethiopians in Israel, it's not a, a walk in the park for them either. The Yemenites have managed to integrate. Uh, now it's up to the Ethiopian community to integrate. And so if anybody, especially since a lot of you are from the Chicago area, would be interested in hearing what this um, rabbi has to say. My only comment was, why don't you call the synagogue and find out when their Zoom is and maybe you can um, let the rest of us know about it in case we you know, have the opportunity to go on the Zoom. Okay. I'm on their website. It was December 13th. Ah. Oh, it was already? Yeah, I'm on their oh. website right now. Thanks, Deb. Thank maybe you. a recording is available. So yeah, maybe. Sometimes yeah. those lectures are recorded. Maybe. So some of you I know haven't spoken at all. And before I do a formal sign up, I just wanted to make sure, I see some of you laughing. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you get an opportunity to say whatever you would like. Oh, Wendy, I see your <laughs> So I really enjoyed this discussion. It's really been terrific. Um, I actually read this book in June and it's sort of interesting how I came upon this book. And that was through my daughter who's 25 and her synagogue that she belongs to in New York City was actually reading this book and then they were having a discussion in July. And I don't know, they had some very different thoughts because they're all in their 20s and they do know many African-American Jews. And so it, it was just a very different conversation. I mean, this, this has been great and everybody has brought their perspectives being older and having grandchildren and things like that. But uh, I would have loved to have heard her speak. I thought maybe she was gonna be joining um, this discussion. But you know, Wendy, I, I have to say this about uh, the age difference you just talked about. When you're looking at people in my age bracket, I'm, I'm part of the age bracket that went through uh, where, where uh, desegregation of schools. Right. Um, it, it, it was such a different time. And although I personally was raised with a bias, I never took to the bias. I, I believe that everybody is a person and, and you, I'm like Mara um, in that way. But I, I have watched in, and I, 
I am, I'm proud to say I'm 65 with a 22 year old child. Okay. Yeah. So I can see in my son, so I'm a skip generation parent. I can see in my son what some of you might be seeing in your children or your grandchildren that race and some of this stuff does not matter as much. Right, of course. And those are always steps in the right direction. I mean, and when I went to Hebrew school, there were no African-Americans in my Hebrew school class. But, but for my daughter at Hillel, there were African-Americans that went to services through Hillel at the University of Michigan. I mean, you know, she knew many of them. And so she just had sort of an interesting perspective about this book. Right. Well, I was teaching at Hillel uh, in, in uh, Farmington Hills, Michigan. We had, I only had, I had two African American students. Right. Okay. And I'm sure that wasn't easy uh, for them. Anybody else? All right. Well, here goes the formal sign off now. Uh, I wanna thank you all for attending Book Buzz. A special thank you to Debbie Kaner Goldich, Susan Farber, our outstanding facilitator. Round of applause. Thank and you, thank you. For their participation in planning and outstanding leadership in creating tonight's program. I wish you all a happy eighth night of Hanukkah. Stay safe, stay healthy. And what more can we say? But thank you and good night.